we have the privilege of bringing together not one but two Audi describers here with us again at the Temple and Di Langford. Heather. Uh, I just want to ask Di about audio describing for the theatre because I've never done it. I've only done written for TV and film. Yeah. So uh, what's, the, what's the difference? You've done both. Yes. The difference is that um, when you're doing film, you know that the action is never going to alter. It's always going to be the same. Whereas when you're doing theatre, one night the actors will be speaking more quickly, one night we're doing it, there'll be a, um, an understudy on who speaks more quickly or more slowly. So you might have less time in between the dialogue to slip your description in. And you've got to do it live the entire time. And you have to do it live the entire time for that reason. You could, I think in France they tried recording it, and whether or not it works, I'm not absolutely sure. They've started to try doing it here, but it means that the technician that, that is actually going to, if you've got it, if you've got it recorded, it's, you're going not, instead of having the describer there, you're going to have a technician who is going to be pressing the button. And unless the technician is very on top of it, or has been involved in actually writing the description and recording it, then it's going to um, actually interfere with the dialogue, which is what we don't want, which is why we do it live. And what do you prefer? Live or pre-recorded, as, um, in, as in television and film or theatre? I like theatre. I do like theatre because I get a chance to see plays I would never get to see otherwise. And I'm, that's my hobby, really, live theatre. And I'm seeing plays I would normally not be able to afford to go and see. And I mean, tremendous range of theatre as well, which is great. And do you find the theatre more challenging to write for? Um, because it's more experimental in its medium, whereas films and TV tend to be... Yeah. Yes, I think, I think theatre is more challenging. Yes, I do. So that stretches you a bit more? Yes, I think it, I think it does, yeah. Definitely. Do you think that you have become more critical of audio-described products now that you have been working on audio description for long? Do you think that... Yeah. I think so. I've, I've started to watch a lot of things with AD on it. And sometimes I think, oh, is that all you're going to tell them? Just give them a bit more. You know, in f help. You know, because I can see what's going on on screen. And, for example, if it's a flashback, say it's a flashback, because otherwise you don't know. And, you know, sometimes it can be very flat and very, you know, I'm not giving anything away apart from the actual facts of what's going on. And I feel that... If you can give people a bit more and fill it in a bit more, then they'll understand more and they'll enjoy it more. You know, you shouldn't be withholding information from people. You should give them as much as possible. So, yeah, I do think sometimes. And also, sometimes I think, shut up. <laughs> like, yes. Shush. Let my, people think. Give them a second. Yeah, my motto is less is more, I think, because um, vision impaired people are used to thinking through things and you don't need to describe absolutely everything. I was listening to um, a description and in the description they had described a lot of things that were on the set. Now they didn't need to do that because during the touch tour beforehand, which is what we have with a the live theatre um, description, which is excellent, because you can go on stage and walk around the set, the description of all those different objects that were on the shelves would be um, in the touch tour, so you didn't need to have them as well in the description. But often there is a time anyway. Sometimes there's so little time that all you have time to say is the name of the person who's speaking, if that's important. And how do you identify the meaningful silence when you have to shut up, as Heather mentioned before, in the theater or on television or a reality show, which has barely no silence in it? Sometimes there was, there was a, um, some stuff that I did on Sex and the City where the relationship between two of the characters was strained because you didn't say anything, you didn't tell her anything. So I just thought, I'm not going to talk over that because that's going to ruin the point. The point is that there is these awful silences all the way through it. And so even though I could have said something, it was important not to say anything because it just stressed how difficult it was for this character to communicate with someone who wasn't replying to, wasn't giving her anything. So, so, and it also, if there's music, just let it breathe a little bit. Just give people time. If I'm listening to something that's got too much AD on it, I turn it off because I can't cope with a constant stream of dialogue from the AD and constant dialogue elsewhere. You need to find a happy medium. And again, sometimes if there's a lot of silence, sometimes you have to say something just to remind your audience that you're still there and something hasn't gone wrong with their set. Yeah. You know, just you know, reassure them that it is still going on. 
sometimes we'll say in advance for a live um, audio description there will be lots of silences or there will be long periods with no description just so that they don't think something that yeah. their headset is broken mm -hmm. so um, they need to know or we'll explain in advance the sort of production it is mm -hmm. so that they'll they'll know that they're still we're still there is there something to be learned from audio description for someone who's not blind or visually impaired yeah yes definitely yeah definitely I've um, talked to people who, who might have gone with um, a visually impaired friend and have listened to the description and have come out afterwards and said, oh, you picked on things I would never have noticed. And mm. I think that's particular in film that happens as well. Mm. If I'm watching something at home uh, on Netflix while I'm doing something else, like sewing or cooking, I put the AD on because I'm not looking at the screen the entire time, so it becomes like partially like radio. So if I'm not watching it, I still know what's happening because I'm hearing it all the time. So yeah, I use it a lot. And we also have found it's very valuable for children with a learning difficulty. If you do perhaps some of the um, Disney films and so on that I've done, mm. that um, it helps to explain the story a bit, um, which they might otherwise find difficulty with. And doing children's stuff is really fun as well because you could adapt your language to... If your audience is under five, there's no point in making it complicated because half the vocabulary you want to use, they haven't even learnt yet. So you can temper it down to their level. And it's the same with everything. You, the, the words you use in your descriptions, um, sh I think, should match the kind of language that's been used in the shows. Yeah. So, you know, if it's a period piece, you will use slightly more florid language than you would if it was a sitcom. So you just, you kind of make it blend in nicely. You know, if it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, then you make your AD tongue-in-cheek as well. So. You know, you take your cue from the programme and, and fix your tone accordingly, so it all sounds like it's meant to be there. So in the same way that you would pick a voiceover that complements the kind of show and the kind of dialogue they say. So the complete detachment that is recommended, for example, in some uh, North American guidelines for audio description, you're not very partial to that. You would prefer no. the audio describer to get implicated in what he or she is saying. Yeah, it's nice. To, sometimes you listen to it and you think, has that person actually watched this? Yeah. Or if they've, if, they've, if they've recorded it, has the person who's doing the voiceover actually seen the show or are they just reading a load of links off a page into a microphone cult? Because it doesn't feel like they've got much to do with it. And I've had arguments with people about whether it's an automated voice or a real voice because the real voices sound so automated yeah. that you could mistake it for an automated voice. But then that always smooths, if people are pushing towards more automation, then making the real voices sound more robotic means that their argument for pushing towards autom automation becomes less of a bumpy road because it's almost there already. But it's a shame. Yes, there's always that argument about uh, how much you can get involved in it, really. And um, so I remember doing something, and afterwards I was doing One Man, Two Governors, and there was a lot of improvisation in that. So you never knew what was going to happen, so you had to be really on the ball. And afterwards somebody said, I could tell you were enjoying it because I could hear you laughing. And in my voice, I was trying not to laugh, but it was very funny. And um, so we decided that that was OK, because I was enjoying it as much as they were rather than being a robot. Yeah. yeah, I think if I was watching it, I would like to think that the person who was providing my AD was in, as enthusiastic about the production as the director and the producer and the people in it. Yeah. You know, not like some kind of, you know, what am I going to say now, detachment from it. You know, it makes it feel like it's a, it's a cohesive unit between, you know, it's a creative piece in the first place. You're supposed to be part of that team. Mm. Yes, but what also you have to remember is that you're not an actor, as part, although I have been an actor, and that you're not part of the company, but you're just enhancing what they're doing. So, you know, you're not overreacting, but you're just making it work for the people listening. Heather and I, thank you very much. Thank you.